No, I'm freezing. I actually feel like an ice cube. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I had enough walking for the day. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So, you know what? God is good. He's always faithful. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. We got quite a few announcements. Oh, can you hand me my phone, please? So we're going to, we're really excited about this right here, the reboot. I don't know about you, but sometimes you just, do you guys know what a reboot is? It means you start over, you start fresh, you start new, you redo it. So we're going to leave you guys, everybody's in here for a few minutes because we're going to explain everything that what we're doing to everybody, including the youth. Except for the little one, she doesn't understand it. She just, she just thinks it's we're gonna have a party or something. So we yeah. have to reboot her multiple times a day. Yeah, <laughs> with discipline. <laughs> it's called discipline. Lots and lots of discipline and lots of talking. Do you, you, yeah, lots and lots of talking. You know, you can't just discipline a child. You got to explain to the child exactly why are you disciplining me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it never just sinks in the first time. So, Father, we thank you for this day, Lord God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this reboot coming up, Lord God. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord God. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, just for the people of God that are here today, Lord. And uh, my husband's going to come up first, and I think he's going to talk a little bit. And then we'll... Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I was hiding in the sound booth doing a reboot on the computer. <laughs> I was uh, working on a different worship set when uh, I couldn't get the lyrics in for the song, so I had to pull that, that older one out. But it, it worked. It's good to have them saved. But I wanted to talk for just a couple of minutes. I know we've already taken a lot of time, so I want to get her to her, her message. But a couple of questions that came up recently, a couple people have asked us uh, what, in regards to tithing and offerings. Do, should we tithe on, on a stimulus check? Great question. Should we tithe on, yeah, just touch, I love these subjects. I love money. I, I don't love money. I like money. <laughs> the love of money is the root to all kinds of evil. But I like money. I'm not afraid of it. I wish I had more. But should we be tithing on uh, income tax checks? So these are questions that a couple of you have asked us. So I said, well, I'll just hit it real quick for five minutes in front of the church and bring out some scriptures. Now, my responsibility as a man of God, as pastor of this church, my responsibility to the Lord is to search the scriptures and to bring out the truth. What you do with the truth or the scriptures or what we preach, as long as it lines up with the word, that's your responsibility between you and God. And so you take that and you do what you have to do. You pray it through. You work it through. That's your walk with God. So I, I am responsible to share what I, what I read, and I will share with you how we approach all that. So looking in Proverbs 2, I'm just going to read down real quick. It says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace will be, they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in our own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And it will be health to our flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, and so your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. And then it goes on to say, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Some good stuff here. And right when I started out in verse 1 of chapter 2, it's really addressing honoring God, but with your life, obeying God. You know, and I remember growing up in the church, we were just beat into us that we had to tithe, tithe, tithe on everything. Tithe, tithe, tithe. But nobody really addressed like our personal walk with the Lord and like what that looked like. And I, I'm going to tell you right now that you can tithe 10% of everything or 20 or 30 or 40 and then go and live, live like hell, live in sin, and it's going to do you no good. 
You can live like an angel, like a saint, and then miss the mark by not tithing or not honoring God with your finances. It's all, it's kind of like a package deal is the best way to explain it. God's looking for obedience. He's looking for you to honor him with your heart. That's what he's looking for. The Bible also teaches us to bring your tithe. And I love this. Our pastor preached this this week. We were listening to a message. He says God's not about, like, he's not a tax collector. He's not running around. He doesn't want, he's, he was running his kingdom far before we all got saved. He was running his kingdom far before we were born. He will run it after we're dead and gone. So he's not after your money like a, like a tax. But he says, bring it to him because he's after your heart. Money just happens to be the nearest and dearest thing a lot of times to our heart because mm-hmm. we work so hard for it. It's what we use to transact and you know, live life and pay bills and all that stuff. So my answer is this. We honor God with all of the increase that God puts in your lap. Now, if you want to break it down to the nitty-gritty, if you're a tither, a lot of you in the house, and you tithe, to some people break it down, I tithe off my gross, I tithe off my net. Well, technically, if you're a tither off your gross and you're getting a tax return, you already tithe that, right? Yep. If you tithe off your net and you get a tax return, I personally would consider that increase. And I'd want to honor God with that. And we do anyway. We don't know. I don't know if we tithe off gross or net, but we tithe. Everything that comes to my house, I don't care what form or fashion it is, we honor God with that. So a stimulus check, a tax return, I don't care if I've already paid God. If it questions in my heart, and I'm wondering if I can take a little bit away from God. Remember this. God said 10% belongs to him. He didn't ask you to give it. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It is. He says when you don't bring it, you're a robber and a thief. That's the scripture. That's not me trying to manipulate. Look at The bills get paid here. I'm not trying to manipulate nobody. I'm trying to get you blessed. I know people, I don't know if you love the pastor said that. I'm trying to get you blessed. It's true. But though. I live by this. I live we by this. We lived under the curse for this. what? Listen, we lived under a curse when we didn't tithe. When we tithed and we started tithing and we kept tithing and tithing and tithing and tithing and tithing, and guess what? All of a sudden there was a curse lifted and things happened in our lives because we it, trusted God. But it's the package. It's your heart. It's your life. Do you love them? And now you heard some truths here today, and they were real quick. Malachi. You know, Malachi says, can a man rob God? And that's where I drew that scripture from. The tithe belongs to him. 10%. All, that's how God works his, in his kingdom and pays his bills here on the earth. Now, I dropped a few nuggets on you. You do with it what you need to do with it. You take it to prayer. You talk to God. That's between you and him anyway. We'll never come after you. We're not the, we're not the Mormons. We're not coming after you for your tithe on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Okay? So I want to do that real quick just so that answers those questions. That's what we do. That's how we live. I want to honor and, and God. And this church ties. We tied the, and this, this church ministry ties. ties to our oversight Site ministry. ministry. So you're, so that this you're church double gets blessed. blessed. Yeah, so... All the money and, and the gifts, the offerings, the tithes that you bring here are actually tithed again to our oversight ministry. And so that's just released it's the honoring. windows of heaven over this ministry, over your you lives, yeah. and over all of us. Amen. 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 So, so reboot 411, real quick here. I'm going to sit today. My sciatic is killing me, literally, but no. <laughs> <laughs> just hurts. Uh, we are. This is a really exciting day here coming up on 411. Yes, Easter is a wonderful, wonderful day. We are going to celebrate that. Andre is going to do a song for us. That's a wonderful day. But for this church, 411 is like a second launch date for us. Okay. This day we are going to have live worship in the house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's going to be the yes clap. It's going to be the first time ever present worship will be performing worship for us, live worship. So very excited. Leading. Leading. Thank you. Leading. (laughs) Leading. Yes. Family First Sunday. We are also going to be doing our first Family First Sunday since basically the lockdown. We tried it, but it didn't work. So we're going to be doing a Family First Sunday. The church will be providing ham, pasta, and a salad. We are asking people to please bring a dish to pass. There is a sign-up sheet over here for a dish to pass. Also, there is a sign-up sheet over there if you want separate seating, okay? If you want separate seating. Let's say Gus invites his wife and James invites his girlfriend and they inv- he invites his son and daughter to come. And you don't want to take that possibility because of COVID. 
you can have an assigned seat. So you can ask for that over there, and we will make sure that you have a reserved table, okay, if you want to take that precaution. If you, if you feel like you don't want to do that, we have open seating as well. You can sit where you want, okay? This is also a great day because this will be our eight-year anniversary, you guys. We are excited about it, eight years. It, I'm not going to say it's been easy. I'm not going to say it's been hard, but it's been all God the whole entire way, so he gets all the praise. Um, youth, you are dismissed. Enjoy, have fun, and uh, be excited about uh, 411 coming up. They should be excited. They're actually getting moved. They're going They're going to move over to the toddler room where the toddler room is. The toddler room is going over to the other side. Uh, there's going to be divided into two rooms so little, little, little ones can come. Because I know that Josh and Casey, they have two little ones, and they're staying away right now as she's, she's with child and a and, uh, little bit of a high risk and everything. So I'm looking forward to having some babies in there as well soon. Looking forward to everybody feeling like we can get back to some type of normal. Some type of normal. Um, Pastor spoke last week on us being built up as a dwelling place, the dwelling place of God, a new identity. You know, it's interesting how after we're saved and after we're born again, that God starts to work on us. It's not an instant, pff, all of a sudden, poof, you're changed. No, that happens at the very end. <laughs> right now, it's a work in progress. Right now, it's, it's a constant day in, day out, week by week, month by month, hour by hour, and literally minute by minute. How are you being changed? We are being transformed continually and all the time. You know, it's interesting. If you pray for something and you ask God for it, he's going to show you something that you need to change in your life. <laughs> Isn't that like him? Oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me show you what you need to change. You need, you need to do this so that I can help you with this. And you know what? All you're doing is being changed into his identity. All you're being done is being changed into something more attributes of him. And you can't go wrong there. I mean, how can you go wrong to be more Christ-like? How can you go wrong with more of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of you? You can't. If anything, that's bonus. That's benefit. That's like, woohoo, let's go. My first scripture is 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. And it says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, Lord, I'm waiting for one, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way which is love. Love is our more ex excellent way. Do you love God? That's what it boils down to. Do you love God? Do you love what he's doing for you in your life? Do you love the things that he's done for you? I know a lot of us have things that we can sit there and we can go, look at what the Lord has done. By the way, we're praying for Amanda, for the baby. We're, we're praying for that baby to come along, Gus, for your niece, right? Yep. You know, these are things that, these are praise reports, too, you guys, when, when prayers are answered by God, when things in our lives are changed by God. Those are things that we can't, we can't even take the credit for that. We cannot take the credit for those things. We've got to give the glory to God. If you don't give the glory to God, you're falling short. We're all being changed. We're all being fit together. You know, it's awesome that we can all come together and we're all different, and we're all unique, and we all have something that each other needs. You know, I if we were all a bunch of Jakes, that would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> if we were all a bunch of Lauras, that would be weird too. It would just be weird. It would just be, it's nice to be unique, isn't it? But it's nice to be able to come together and all fit together because we have one thing in common. We have a Father in heaven. We have this new identity that we relate with, with him. We have that same type of heart you know, when Andre was talking about the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and all those, and faithfulness, and kindness, and gentleness, we all need to walk in so much more of that these days. 
when we sit there and I, my husband shows me these things that he reads sometimes, and boy, you know, the world, it's like, it's like watching a toilet flush, but it's taking a really long time. <laughs> it's just like, wow, it's just going down. So a young man got uh, expelled from college because he stood up and he said, a man is a man and a woman is a woman, period. And he got kicked out of college for standing up for it. They attacked Dr. Seuss. They're attacking. I'm sorry, it's history. History, right? You can rewrite it, but you can't change it. Because we know where the next attack is going to be on the church. So they're going to write out Jesus, you know. Because we're going to be a bunch of haters. So love one another in all of our uniqueness. This is the thing in the world. If we are unique and we are different, we're haters. If we stand up for things that we believe in that are right, like a man and a woman or a man and a woman, like I always say, break it down to the chromosome test, you guys. Chromosomes don't change. <laughs> Can't change that. That's what it is. That's the way God created it. But when we embrace each other's uniqueness, when we show that love of God and we show that we as Christians can be fit together, into this dwelling place that we as Christians, you know the worst thing is when a bunch of Christians can't get along. <laughs> what does that say to the world? I don't know about you guys, but I know a lot of churches in this local town, sorry guys, they don't want to get along. They don't even want to work together. They don't want to play in the sandbox together. They won't even push you on a swing. It's like, uh-uh. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. We all have something that should unite us, not deflect us. We should be being, building each other up. We all share one identity. We all share Jesus. I loved it when Jesus said, said like my husband had spoke last week, who do they say that I am? Do people ever, you, you, don't you want to know what people say in conversations about you when they go to describe you? Wouldn't you like to be that fly on the wall just to hear what they say about you, to understand <laughs> Some are going, no, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to know. <laughs> I'd like to hear the old me and the new me. I'd love to hear those comparisons. Those I would love to hear. You know, before she was a big old bee. <laughs> oh, woo! Boy, she could, yeah. And then here, oh, no, she's not. You know, those are the differences that you want to know, and that's how you know that Christ has done it in you. When you can sit here and say, 30 years sober, hallelujah, thank you, God. Did it by him. Did it by him. But I once had this identity that the world had of me. I was, I was molded and shaped by the world. Our youth, society tries to mold and shape us. That's why I'm so proud of our youth back there and what Lynn's doing with the youth. Teaching them and being totally on point with what they're dealing with today in society because they have a lot more on their plate than we ever had on our plate when we were growing up. We thought we had it rough. They have it so much rougher, the influence of the world. So the definition I want to let you know of identity is the distincti distinguishing character or personality of an individual. Those are our attributes. When faced with an identity dilemma, Every decision we make either more firmly roots us or masks our identity. So we can be changed by the world or we can take our identity in Christ. That's why you never see someone change like immediately, right? Overnight. I mean, we can make little tweaks and things like that, but it's a gradual change. It takes time. It takes time in the core values. It takes time in our beliefs. It takes time in our character. It's a gradual stacking daily of the decisions that we consciously make. I can see people slip away when they stop reading their Bible. I see people start to slip away when they stop reading their devotional. You can see people slipping away when they stop going to church. These are things that keep us rooted and grounded in God. These are the things that keep our identity close to him. These are what change us. This is what makes us more Christ-like. I don't know about you, but I want to be more Christ-like. 
I remember the girl that I met over here at the rehab. Her name was Angel. And uh, she probably was 65 at the time when I was speaking over there at the rehab. And she thought, you know what? My life is just never going to be the same. She says, I just, she said, after she had accepted Jesus, she wanted, she wanted this, she wanted a change. She spent two years out at Total Freedom. That's a drug recovery. She's been sober for two years. Her life is, she's, she's completely changed person. But it takes that first step. It takes that wanting to change her identity. She didn't want to be known as a 65-year-old drug addict, you know, the lady that drinks booze and sits on the corner down the street in Rochester. She didn't want her grandkids to know her as that. So she made a life decision. She accepted Jesus, first of all, into her life. And then next thing you know, he got a hold of her, and he didn't let go. And you know what? She took it for the ride that it is. She said, you know what, Lord, if you're going to change me, change me. Whatever I need to do to get through, do it. Whatever I need to change in my life, do it. The biggest thing sometimes is, I remember when we left California. I needed change. I knew that California was going down. I'm sorry, California. <laughs> I, I knew it was getting bad out there with the gangs. And I mean, when they got metal detectors in the high schools and stuff like this, I went, whoa, it's getting bad out here. It's too crowded. There's too many people. I mean, we had a guy die in the parking lot across the street, and it was a church parking lot. He got beat to death by a gang. And all I could think about was my young daughter at that time. She was in ninth grade in high school, and I thought, she's going to a high school with metal detectors for guns. A kid just died in the parking lot across the street, and I thought we lived in a decent neighborhood. It's time to go. We need a change. We need to change for us because we wanted to live this different type of life. Sometimes lifestyle change is a good thing. Sometimes moving is a good thing. Sometimes not moving is a good thing. It depends on what God wants you to do. You know, I always looked at it this way. God says that he's the potter. Are we the clay? Are you pliable? I know sometimes I get a little hard. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't do that. You know how hard it is for me to sit here right now? <laughs> I am not this type. I don't, I don't sit. I don't sit. But my back's going, nope, you're sitting. <laughs> you are sitting. Hey, if you don't sit, you're not going to be able to stand. So I think I'll sit. <laughs> Shaping molding us into what you know what i remember when we had a pastor tell us you are square pegs trying to fit into round holes and i'm thinking to myself okay is that a good thing or a bad thing and then i realized okay we're christ in us the hope of glory in us why are we trying to fit back into the world why am i trying to take on part of the world into my characteristic i don't have that anymore I don't, I don't have that. And I understood now that I was a square. I had become square. I don't mind. I'm square. Remember that old saying, you're square? That means you're kind of, you know, I'm square. Rather be square than round. But guess what? I had to be molded in shape. The world is round and I became square. I don't fit anymore. I find it interesting and funny when my husband runs into contractor guys. Boy, do they curse up a storm. <laughs> and then my husband starts to talk. Oh, and by the way, I'm a pastor. Oh. All of a sudden, they're like backpedaling. And, <laughs> <you know. laughs> and my husband comes home and tells me all these little funny stories about the contractors that he meets. But he always knows the Christian ones because you know what? They don't curse. They don't talk about their wild weekends or anything like that. He can always spot those ones. And it always turns out they're all Christians because they're squares. They're not round. They're not round little pegs. I want to let you know a few people that didn't let the world change them and their identity when the pressure was on. Because let me tell you, people, the pressure is on. The pressure is on for you. The pressure is on for your children. The pressure is on for everything 
that we live by and everything that we hold dear to us. I call this message unshaken identity. Hold on to your de identity in Christ. Do not let anything move you. Do not let anything shake you. Do not let the world try to change you. These people were unshaken in their identity. Noah, how many years did he work on that ark? And he was mocked and he would, oh, every day I can imagine it. They just came out to pick on him and mock him and call him a fool. Who was a fool when the rain came? But he didn't move. He stayed true to what God told him to do. Moses, rejected. But he didn't change. Once God got a hold of him, he stayed true to God. He didn't let anything shake him up and change his identity. Even when Pharaoh was chasing him, he didn't let it change him. He stayed true to God. Job was tried and tested. He lost everything. Everything. Friends, family, kids, wealth, everything. Thing. Want to talk about a broken man. But he didn't shake. He didn't crumble. He held on to his identity. He knew who he had in him. He knew who was with him. He knew who was supporting him through it. Elijah was threatened, but he held on. May have been, you know what? We have points of crumbling where we stumble and we go, Oh, Lord, of course we cry out. But who are we crying out to? Are we running to God or away from God? Strengthening us, shaping us, molding us, protecting us, making us sharp, making us strong. You know a brick that has gone through the fire twice is harder than any other brick? Oh Lord, let me go through the fire again. No, thank you. Twice as hard. So a burnt brick is better than any other brick. I'd rather be a burnt brick. Because a burnt brick is a strong brick. That means it can withstand a lot more than just a regular brick. So when you're going through those testing and those trials and those fires, bring it on. Because God's in the midst of that. Wasn't he in the midst with Daniel? He'll stand in that fire with you. He'll see you through that flood. He'll make it through. You'll make it through. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to threat about it. Esther. Esther was a, would have been a death sentence. But she trusted God. She knew who her identity was in. Even if I die today, it's okay. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm in my Lord and I'm in my Savior. John the Baptist pretty much was called a weirdo. Yep. Who's this guy out in the desert, man? <laughs> Runs around like a caveman out there in the desert. But on fire for God, and he didn't care, did he? That's why I hate it when a church tries to change what you look like. Jesus didn't come along and tell John the Baptist to take off his camel hair and all that stuff, did he? Didn't tell him to change a bit, because it was what was in here. He wanted it what was in here. The heart. Think about Mary, the mother. She could have been shunned. But she wasn't, was she? Not shunned at all. Her husband embraced her, and the whole world profited by it. He could have walked the other way, but he didn't. Think about it. If God showed up in the room... And you had a choice between the world and changing for him. How many of us would change for him? Or would we decide that, you know what, I can't risk that because, you know, I have this, you know, this, this reputation <laughs> that I've got to protect. I've met people like that, that the reputation was more important than serving God. And they chose their reputation over God. Joseph could have done that. 
but he didn't. He decided to trust God. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Where? Wherever. Wherever. That's a shocker when you're in the bathroom, but yes, wherever you go. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of good prayer time in the bathroom. In the shower, on the toilet, I don't care. I have a lot of good prayer time in the bathroom. That's where I met Jesus the first time, was in the bathroom. On my face, crying out, because I wanted to get off that roller coaster ride of crystal meth quicker than anything else. And I felt like the gates of hell were at my doorstep. And I cried out to God, and the whole bathroom turned bright white, and I knew that I was in the presence of the Lord. I knew that day. I knew that I had met Jesus in that bathroom, and I knew that he was going to help me get sober. He was going to help me get to church. He was going to help me change who I was, and that I needed him more than he needed me. <laughs> But once he gets a hold of you, don't try to get away. It's a, it, it, that's just, that's, that, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. So if you're being fit together and shaped the way God is shaping you to be built, don't fight it. Let him do it. it makes it a lot easier on both of you. A lot easier on both of you. I'm going to go back 30 plus years I remember the day that I thought that, you know what, I could dabble in the world just a little bit and still be in church. Okay, I'd been sober for maybe a year. And I decided I was going to do a line of crystal meth. Where did I run to? Church. I went to church higher than a kite, but told everybody I was high just so that I could have the peace and the comfort of where? The place where I knew that I could find safety the place that I knew I wasn't going to be rejected by them, the place where I knew that they knew that my identity with what I slipped back to was not who I was, that I was chasing after God, not a judgmental people, a person and people that said, we're going to help you through this. Don't fret it. You stumbled. You fell. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and let's move on. That was the last time I ever did math because I didn't get judged. I didn't get shunned. I didn't go, oh, you're high. Oh, my gosh. Why don't we go shove you in a room somewhere? No, no. Sit here. It's okay. You can get through worship. You'll get through the message. Believe it or not, a high that used to last three days lasted a total of four and a half hours. God. Only God could do something like that. But where did I run? I ran to church. I ran to God. I didn't know that God, you know, would be like with me right there because I was new. I figured church was a good place to go because a lot of strength was there. So I ran to church, ran to the people, ran to the people of God. Guess what? We got a whole place out there. Like I told you about the toilet that's being flushed. People are going to be running to you. Trust me on this. People will be running to you and asking you in not too long from now, how are you not shaken right now? How are you not being moved by everything that's going on in society? Trust God. Trust God. Don't compromise. Do not compromise. Daniel I was raised Catholic, so I went through confirmation, and I picked out my confirmation name was Danielle. See, I knew the characters of the Bible. Remember, I did study the word even as a child because I went to Catholic school. So I picked out Danielle because I thought Daniel was the most awesome person in the Bible. Needless to say, I didn't understand the full manifestation of that until I was much older why I chose him, not until really actually recently, because he didn't sway, he didn't move. He was placed in a place where he could have changed to be like them, where he was actually asked to partake and help lead a king, but he didn't change. He actually asked them to help him stick to his ways, Stick to his truths. I don't want to eat off of the king's table. I'll learn the things you want me to learn. I'll work with your sorcerers. I'll work with your astrologers. 
but let me serve my God. Let me be with my God. Other words, I'm the same way. World, do you want to do what you want to do? But let me serve my God in the midst of this Babylonian society. Let me show you who's victorious. Let me show you who's immovable and unchangeable and unshapeable. And what happened? Daniel was found with more favor. He looked better. He excelled in all of his studies. He pleased the king better than anybody else. And he was found to be, I thought this was interesting because we talked about tide today, 10 times better than all the others in the entire realm. 10 times better. He excelled in everything. 10 times more than anybody else. Because it's called God's favor, God's identity, God's chosen person. You're all a chosen vessel. You are all chosen. And he was appointed for a reason and a special time. We're all appointed. We all have a place. Do you know, there's going to be divine opportunities in your life when your identity and who you are in Christ Jesus is going to be brought to the front lit. Where you're going to know that you're in that moment of a situation where God is going to use you to help change somebody's life, to alter the course of somebody's entire future. But the point is, are you going to be at that moment and at that time? Are you going to be prepared? Are you going to be unchangeable, unstoppable? Are you going to know who you are in Christ Jesus? And are you going to stand firm in it and be like Daniel was? In Daniel 2, 27 through 28, he was called to the presence of the king. And Daniel said... In Daniel 2, 27 through 28, he said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the musicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and your visions of your head upon your bed were these, and Daniel expounded. First thing he did was he let him know it didn't come from Daniel, it didn't come from all my studies. It came from God, and God alone. He knew who his identity was in Christ Jesus. He knew who his Lord was. He knew Yahweh. He knew he was with God, one with God. He knew he had found favor through God. In Daniel 2, 47, after Daniel had interpreted and told the king exactly what he needed to, like I said, there's going to be a divine appointments in our lives, and they are going to come. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. Divine opportunity. Do you not think that the heart of the king knew? Only somebody who could speak that, that comes from the heart of knowing that that God was the God of gods. There was, and he had so many gods, Nebuchadnezzar. But he knew that Daniel's God was a true God. He recognized that he was the Lord of kings. In other words, he, he recognized that this God is above me and rules over me and reigns over me and has given me this dream. He gave it. He recognized Jesus. What more honorable thing than to get somebody to recognize that it's God in their life that's working. It's God that's changing them. It's God that's revealing things to them. It's God that's blessing them. You know, in our house building, I tell everybody, when I go buy a $200 sink for 60 bucks, I let that person know, you do know that g God did this. I let them know, God built this. Not me. Yes, my husband has put in great amounts of work. I give him a round of applause because he's done amazing work. 
but God has blessed us. God gets all the glory. When God tells you to do, I'll tell you, when God tells you to go to the bank and refinance, listen to him. Number one. When God tells you to go buy something from somebody off of Facebook, and you're kind of having that little bit of doubt, and you're thinking it's way too good to be true, trust God, it's a blessing for you. You're his children. He's going to bless you. He is going to bless you. I'm going to let you know, being in covenant with God, he will bless you. You know, some people go, well, I've tied for two years. Well, did you tie for three? Because you just might be on that third year breakthrough. I'm telling you, he will bless you. Trust him in his word. It's the word of God. Trust him in the things that he tells you to do. When he tells you to get up in the morning and go to church and you're tired and you don't want to go, I was standing in the bathroom going, oh my gosh, my legs are going to fall off. See? That's an emergency button. In case any of our toddlers or anything is going on in the back area. So if you ever hear that, that means that ushers and they go back there and they make sure that nothing is happening to the children. An intruder, a break-in, anything like that. So if you ever hear that, everybody remain calm. Okay? Ushers will get up and they will make sure. Because we, we don't have anybody coming in this way, so they had to come in that way. <laughs> Huh? Broadcast system. And it works. Yay. Good job. So let's be that inspiration that changes lives. You know, I'm never going to forget Angel as long as I live. Because I was over at that rehab teaching. She got saved. Gave her the number to total freedom, and here it is two years later, and her life is completely changed. I could say I got a little bit to do with it. He's got all the credit. He put me over there. He kn I knew about total freedom only because of him. Give him the glory where glory is due. He deserves it all, every last bit of it, every last bit of it. My closing final Scripture, Daniel 12, 3. I love this scripture. <laughs> Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's our job. That's our duty what better thing to do for God after all that he's done for us but to help him, help others, to change them to righteousness? I know Martha speaks to ladies, and I know that she's helping them, changing them to righteousness. Worship changes people to righteousness. Teaching changes people to righteousness. You never know in your workplace when somebody's going to come to you and they're going to be devastated by something in their life. And you're going to be able to point into the direction of the person that helped you. Because you have been changed. Because you now are part of his identity. Your identity is in him and he is in you. And you're going to be able to help them. And you're going to bring them to righteousness. You're going to bring them to salvation. Our daughter, Tasha, I won't cry. Yeah, I will. Please. <laughs> My daughter was not a hugger. <laughs> My husband and I would have to go in and we'd go, okay, come on, Tasha, group hug. And we'd grab a hold of her and we'd just squeeze her. I'll get there. <laughs> the day that she died, the day before she died, 
would we have gone to her house? And I said, you going to watch Camilla on Wednesday? She says, yeah. She says, even if I don't feel real good, I'll watch her. I said, okay. She says, you know, Mom, we'll just sit around and we'll just cuddle a little. My daughter didn't talk like that. That's how you know that God got in here. Change that tough old little trucker girl <laughs> into a girl who said, well, just cut a little, little. That's how God works. He takes those hard cases. He takes those round people of the world where the world has shaped them. And he eventually starts to just chisel away and reshapes them into that new identity, into that new person, to be built up in Christ, into a dwelling place, all fit it together on a foundation that is immovable. If I were to just try, I can't even begin to express to you how much God loves you. I know how much he loves me, but sometimes it's really hard to, to just let you know that he loves you that much. I mean, he just, it's like, it's like the biggest tidal wave or tsunami that could possibly come over you. Because that's how much he loves you. He wants to wrap you in his arms. If you have troubles, he wants to help you work through them. If you're having identity crises, he wants to help you become that person that you're meant to be in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Not outside of him, but in him. But we just need to stay in that place where God's able to mold us and shape us and be pliable. Sometimes he takes away. Sometimes he adds to us. Remember, we're clay. Take away, shave off. Just be willing. But remember who's doing all the changing for you. And then become unchangeable by the world. Unshakable, unchangeable, and know who your identity is in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord God. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do, Lord Jesus. I thank you for taking me and others here, Lord God, and shaping us and molding us, Lord God, into the building block, a dwelling place for you, Lord Jesus. I thank you that we come together, Lord God, in a place of unity for you. And I just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, I want to tell you just a couple more things. Real quick, just real quick. Don't run away, please. Also, starting in April, because April is a big month, okay? April.